In this video, I'm going to talk about the importance of collecting basic firm information and security information when performing industry analysis and security analysis. So I'll start off talking about where to get some of that data if you have access to Bloomberg. And then I'll talk about the importance of understanding and knowing when insiders or corporate insiders have traded recently and what impact that could have on the, the movement of a, a firm's equity. And then finally, I'll wrap up with a discussion of corporate governance, the strategy of the firm, and then the risks that the firm faces, because all of those play a vital role in determining the returns going forward for a firm. Okay, so let's talk about where you get your basic information about a firm. So let's say you have picked a stock that you want to analyze. Well, the first thing you would want to do if you have access to Bloomberg is look up some background information on that stock. And the best way to get that is the DES function, the description function. And that function is going to contain a large amount of information on the stock, its headquarters, a uh, number of employees, who the management are, some of the basic ratios like the PE ratio, that kind of information. So for example, you'll get some information on the ticker symbol, the NAICS code or the SIC code. You'll find information on the industry, the address, the number of employees, like I said. You'll also find some information on things like the 52-week high and low, the market cap, the shares outstanding, and the float. Uh, so the float is the number of shares that are actually available to be traded. So these are your total shares minus any treasury shares that the firm has in its vault. Uh, we also can look at the short interest as a percentage of the float. So that's something that we would always want to collect. And then things like beta will always be there. We can also, from this DES function, get a basic description of the firm. So a couple of months ago, I did a basic analysis of the company Starbucks. So I analyzed its equity and I essentially did I put together a, a very basic research report so this is a paragraph that uh, came I, I essentially paraphrased the information in the DES function but there it is the next place you can get good information is the CF function or company filings function so any filings that a publicly traded firm in the US has made to the SEC are usually going to be available. So things like the 8K or the 10K or the uh, the 10Q or the DEF 14A. So all of these most important filings you're going to have access to in the CF function. So if you want to get a background on the nominees for each directorship position that's coming available at the next shareholder meeting, you can find that in DEF 14A. If you want a description of a firm's risks, you can find that under the business risks section. You can also find some information provided by the CEO of the firm and Honestly, a lot of that is written or approved by lawyers, but uh, it gives you a sense of where the, the firm is headed in the MDNA section of the 10K. Finally, we sometimes also want to collect ESG information. So there's a big push now in investments to invest in firms that are more green, so maybe they're they're trying to become carbon neutral, or maybe they have good governance factors, or let's say they're they're avoiding doing business with companies that employ slave labor, for example. Uh, ESG factors that you can find on the Bloom Bloomberg terminal uh, under the ESG function are going to provide you with that information. Okay, so next I want to talk about insider trading. So the SEC requires that any corporate insider who has access to relevant information has to disclose when they buy and sell shares. So if you're any member of the C-suite, maybe you're a director of the firm, uh, those trades are going to be disclosed. And the reason that's important is because if we see a very large amount of buy activity on a firm's shares by its corporate insiders, this could indicate that these corporate insiders who likely have inside information believe that the shares are undervalued. Vice versa, if we see that a lot of corporate insiders are selling their shares, this could indicate that they know something that's not publicly available, and they might be offloading those shares before the share price tanks. 
So for example, if I look at AMC Entertainment Holdings, which had one of the best returns in the US market in the last year, uh, I can get a sense of just from basic Yahoo Finance, the number of shares that were purchased by corporate insiders in the last six months, so about 2.5 million, and the number of sh shares that were sold by those corporate insiders, so about 2.51 million. Uh, so there's a net difference of about 23,000 shares here. Uh, honestly, I'm not too sure this tells us a whole lot, uh, but there was a, a net sale. Uh, so more shares were sold than purchased by corporate insiders. Uh, nowadays, a lot of share purchases and sales tend to happen uh, on fixed intervals just to avoid the appearance that uh, maybe corporate insiders are uh, buying and selling to front run the market. Uh, you, I mean, if you're a CEO or any other member of the C-suite, you don't want to give off that appearance. So uh, a lot of the time you'll, you might advertise or let uh, shareholders know, hey, I'm, uh, I'm planning to sell a certain number of shares, maybe three months from now, six months from now, et cetera, on fixed intervals. Okay, next, we want to talk about corporate governance. So corporate governance is something that you certainly talked about in Finance 300. Uh, it, it really just refers to how the management and the board are being overseen. So we like good, strong, healthy corporate governance. And there's a lot of metrics that indicate this. One of the most common is an indicator for whether the CEO is also the chairman of the board. And when that CEO is also the chairman of the board, we call that CEO-chairman duality. Now, the reason we care about this is because historically, a lot of research has tended to demonstrate that these firms that have a large concentration of power in one individual tend to underperform because there's, there's not as much effective oversight in most time periods. Uh, so, for example, if you have Mark Zuckerberg, who's the CEO and chairman of Facebook, basically anything that Mark Zuckerberg wants to happen is going to happen because the board is the organization that would hire and fire a CEO. And, and the fact that Mark Zuckerberg controls a very large portion of the voting rights of Facebook means that as long as he wants to remain the CEO, he will. Uh, now, there are some time periods like, let's say, the breakout of a, a worldwide pandemic when CEO-chairman duality uh, might actually be a good thing. Because if you have a large concentration of power, what some researchers, including myself, have found is that during COVID-19, the companies that had that concentration of power actually responded the best. In other words, they had a, a much better return around the the announcement that everything was shutting down in February and March of 2020. Uh, so these firms that had CEO chairman duality, they tended to outperform the market. But overall, CEO chairman duality is something that we we tend to uh, like not to see. We like to see a separation of the CEO role and the chairman role. Uh, next, we also want to look at the percentage of independent directors. And the reason we care about the percentage of directors that are independent is because when a company has a very large percentage of independent directors, what this means is that there's more people sitting on the board who have oversight of the executives, the management of the firm, who are more likely to give pushback to said management. So a lot of firms like Apple, so here's Apple's current makeup of its board, uh, will have a very large percentage of their directors who are independent. And so we often see blue chip companies in the U.S. tend to have independent director percentages in, you know, above 50%. I mean, Apple, uh, Ford, Berkshire Hathaway, these are going to be companies that will typically have a, a very, very large majority of independent directors. The higher is usually the better. Next, we also want to know the board size of a company. And the reason we want to know this is because boards are, they're just like any organization. Uh, the effectiveness of the board d is often seen as being dependent on the size of the board. So large boards, 
uh, they tend to be a bit more unwieldy. So if you have 20 people on your board, getting a consensus and getting everyone in a room is a lot more difficult than if you have a very small board. Uh, so large boards tend to be very good for conglomerates where you have a company that owns operations in multiple industries, and they also tend to be very good for banks because banks are very, very complicated organizations, and they're, they're tied up with a lot of regulation. However, tech companies, they are very often better served by having smaller boards. So for example, a company like Snap or uh, Facebook or some, some very small startup, they benefit from having a very small board that can reach a consensus very quickly and can meet fairly regularly. And having a smaller board makes it much more flexible, quite frankly. So small boards are good for tech companies. Larger boards tend to be good only for conglomerates and organizations that are very, very uh, diversified. And then finally, insider ownership. So insider ownership, we tend to like to see a sizable portion of insider ownership. So ownership by the CEO and the other managers and the board members. Uh, there is a large amount of research as to what the ideal percentage is. Uh, and that, that percentage is often seen as somewhere between about 10% and 30%, depending on the study. Now, the reason we care about insider ownership is because if you have a very large percentage of insider ownership, what that indicates is that the insiders, their wealth is dependent on whether the firm's share price rises or falls. So they have an incentive to ensure that they're maximizing shareholder value. If the corporate insiders do not have a stake, let's say they own a very small percentage of shares relative to the rest of their, their portfolio, uh, what that could mean is that they care a lot less about maximizing shareholder value and they might try to extract wealth in the form of some benefits like getting a corporate jet or taking more vacations. So obviously that takes money away from the firm, but they get those perks. Now, all of this information I just mentioned can be found pretty easily in Bloomberg. So there is an ESG function. Uh, we do have access to corporate governance data. So the, these are the statistics for Starbucks at the time that I pulled the data. Uh, so Starbucks at the time that I pulled this data had 11 directors and 10 of them were non-executives. It was only the, the chairman who I believe was the, uh, well, he was a corporate insider. Uh, we also like to see some other corporate governance metrics like the percentage of female directors. Uh, usually this increase in diversity, this is associated with uh, more discussion in board meetings. Uh, so I actually have some research on this topic myself. And what myself and my co-authors find is that the larger the percentage of female directors on the board, the more uh, valuable the company. Uh, so essentially, as you add female directors, valuation of the company rises. And one of the arguments for this is that it's not just groupthink. You don't have a bunch of yes men sitting on a board just approving everything. If you have more diversity, that could mean more diversity of opinion, which means more talking, more back and forth, and more scrutiny of any decision. Uh, we also want to look at things like the average tenure of the directors. Uh, so if there's a lot of turnover in a board of directors, that might be seen as a bad thing, but you also don't want to see a bunch of directors who have been sitting on this board for like, oh, 30 or 40 years. That means they're probably quite old. Uh, their, their average age might be well above 65. Historically, individuals who are 65 or younger uh, tend to be much better as a check against management power. And then also, we do want to look at the number of boards served. Uh, so the reason this is important is we don't really like to see that all of our directors are on like three or four or five boards, what that indicates is that maybe their time is split between too many boards. Maybe they have too many irons in the fire, so to speak. They have too much going on. Are they really going to devote as much time as they need to to our firm? Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is strategy. And uh, when we talk about strategy or a firm's corporate strategy, there are a lot of definitions out here. I'll just give you the one that I think makes most sense to me as an investor, and that is a strategy is a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major or overall aim. Uh, 
And as investors, we appoint a board and that board appoints a management team. And that management team's goal should be shareholder value maximization, at least for your traditional C-Corp. Now, how they achieve that is their strategy. And I think every good strategy should have three components. And there's a couple of researchers who have kind of put together this these three components. This isn't my own construction. But these three components that I think we always need to make sure exist in a firm's operations are the objective. Well, for most firms, that's going to be maximize shareholder value. Uh, scope. So where does this firm operate geographically? And then also in which industries does it operate? And then finally, competitive advantage. So if our firm has a profit margin of like 30%, what's to stop other competitors from entering the market and capturing some of that value? So what competitive advantage does our firm have? Do we have the ability to produce units for a lower price than our competitors? Do we have some brand that allows us to uh, lock up customers long term. Maybe everyone wants to buy Starbucks products rather than going to Costa Coffee or Luckin Coffee, which don't have the, the cachet that Starbucks does. So we typically want to be able to articulate the strategy in about one, maybe two sentences. If we can do that, then the firm probably has a pretty concise strategy. So for example, Here's how I would phrase Starbucks strategy. So Starbucks objective is to be the leading brand of coffee and tea in each operating market by selling high quality drinks and food and by providing the Starbucks experience. So anytime you walk into a Starbucks, whether that's in the US or outside the US. Uh, so, you know, I've been to a couple Starbucks outside the US and, you know, it's, it's always a, a good quality experience. And that's, that is evident. I mean, that holds with their strategy. I mean, you know what you're getting at a Starbucks, the same way you know what you're getting at a McDonald's, for the most part. Uh, regional tastes change, but they offer the same experience, and they offer high-quality food and drink, and so I would say they have a pretty healthy strategy. Okay, finally, we want to know what the big risks are for our firm. If Let's say our firm has had a very high return over the last couple of years, but there's a good chance that, oh, let's say the firm could be supplanted by some new technology. Maybe some competitor has just developed or could develop a new technology that eliminates all of the ability of our firm to generate sales. That's a pretty big risk that we should know about as investors. Uh, we can identify the risks of a firm through a couple of ways. You could use the RSKS function in Bloomberg, or you could just look at the 10K and look under the risk factors uh, in the 10K. So let me show you this. Okay, so this is Starbucks Form 10K uh, for the fiscal year ending September 29th, 2019. And it has all the standard sections we'd like to see. Uh, so the business section, this will allow us to identify all the basic information that I, I've already talked about. So things like the, the strategy of the firm, the basic information about addresses, uh, number of employees, operations, where the firm operates, where, what it does. Uh, in the next section, we can identify risk factors, and that's always gonna be in this, this second section. So notice here that Starbucks has put together a list of big risks that could affect the firm's ability to generate a positive return for investors. So things like economic conditions in the US and international markets, uh, things like brand reputation damage. Uh, we could also see risks that do not satisfactorily fulfill their responsibilities and commitments. And then we have a huge number of other big risks. And these are all identified by Starbucks management. So things like evolving customer preferences and tastes that mean that their customers might not want coffee. Uh, reliance on key business partners could be a risk. Uh, all of these are risks that could affect the share price of Starbucks because these are going to affect the discount rate of the firm. And they'll also affect the free cash flows of the firm going forward. So 
when we put together our research report, we want to identify the most important risks at the very least. I mean, some of these are going to be more important than others. So things like U.S. economic conditions or economic conditions around the world or political risk in a couple of countries where Starbucks has a massive number of stores. All of these things are going to have a huge impact on the firm's possible cash flows. So that's that. Those are the basics when we collect data for security analysis. Uh, so this is where we're going to start. We, we always want to start with the basic information and understand uh, how the firm actually makes money. And factors like corporate governance, risk factors, number of employees, all of these things are going to be very important to us as we determine whether or not we want to buy shares of the company's equity, or whether if we already own shares, we want to divest those shares. So I'll end the video here and I'll see you on the next one.